I was going to facetiously say that this is the first episode of the of the real gray zone. When you look at the color of my hair, rather than those so-called journalists, you know, Max Blumenthal and Aaron Marte <laughs> and the others. But uh, uh -huh. I guess I won't do that. Uh, on a more serious note, this is a very difficult time right now because all of a sudden we're starting to see a different type of financial crisis. And I wanted you two to talk because, Dennis, you were in Congress for 16 years. You did some of the most withering cross-examination I've ever seen of bank and federal reserve type individuals. Some of them were literally sweating because you asked probing deep questions that your staff had prepared and you don't accept any PAC money. So you had no reluctance at all to get right to the nitty gritty of what was happening in the first bank meltdown You know that Michael wrote about. I have Michael here because he is a great economist. He's one of the eight economists in the world who predicted the housing crisis. He did a cover story in Harper's Magazine that was stunning with charts and graphs and explaining exactly why the housing bubble would collapse as it did. I was going to note, Michael became famous for first writing this book called Super Imperialism in 1972, which became a how-to manual for the State Department and the rest of our government about literally monetary imperialism. How would we become the reserve currency? It becomes, and of course, Michael has so many other books. His more recent one I love is, and forgive them their debts, you know, from the, our father. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And my favorite that every politician should read okay, is the bubble and beyond because it breaks down exactly what the financial capitalist system is about today. We're no longer industrial capitalists. It's financial capitalism of skimming off money. So I wanted to gather the two of you together because you bring these bookend ideas of what happens in the legislature, which is pretty corrupt, you know, purchased by big money, banking and oil and everyone else. And what happens, why, what is the economics behind this? I'd like to start with Michael, just asking you the question as the sort of the ground rules, you know, the sort of laying the block work. Why did these three banks collapse? Well, uh, because of the fact that the Federal Reserve tried to finally end an era. And the era was the 13 years of uh, quantitative easing that uh, followed from uh, Obama's decision to bail out the banks in uh, 2009. Uh, the idea was the banks had made so many bad loans uh, that they were insolvent. And so the Federal Reserve began to flood the market with the liquidity and spent $9 trillion pumping bank credit into the market so that they could raise housing prices uh, for Americans and uh, save the banks from losing money on their mortgages. Uh, and they could they created uh, a bond uh, boom, the biggest bond market boom in history by reducing uh, wage uh, interest rates from about 7% uh, way down to zero. Uh, and you had uh, the stocks and bonds that the wealthiest 1% own soaring in price and uh, that uh, zero interest rate policy of uh, uh, flooding the market with credit for the banks is uh, why the economy was polarizing between the uh, uh, the P uh, the one percent or the ten percent of the population that owns most of the stocks and bonds uh, and the rest of the population so, well, so Michael just hold, hold on a minute what you're describing is is a uh, an underlying structural issue uh, that not only, uh, the, the the Fed, uh, the government, and the government are helping to pick winners and losers, but they're also accelerating the wealth of the com of the country upwards. Uh, the wealth is held really by uh, uh, the, uh, the the financial and uh, insurance and real estate sector, and uh, the wealth of the country really is made by uh, who owns this wealth? The wealth are the savings. The wealth of the uh, uh, creditor class is the debt of the 99%. So when they talk about wealth, all this wealth takes the form of debt that's owed uh, by the 99%. So you could say that uh, what's been growing is debt as well as wealth. It depends what side of the balance sheet you're going to look at and uh, how you're going to look at how it's distributed. So this was just saying though, the wealth is being redistributed upward by turning yes. everyone into a debtor to yes. a creditor class. 
they collect the rentier income as you describe in all your books, Michael. Yeah. And if they ever want to foreclose, they can take everything. I mean, BlackRock today has what ten trillion dollars of assets. Right. And they're buying up homes. So are we going to become basically a renter society where we're basically indentured servants? Well, BlackRock uh, began by buying up uh, homes of the eight or nine million people that uh, Obama evicted from their houses by breaking his promise to write down uh, the junk mortgage loans to realistic market prices. And instead of writing down the loans, uh, he invited his uh, uh, bankers and campaign contributors to the White House and said, I'm the only guy protecting you from uh, the mob with the pitchforks, namely, uh, mainly the black and Hispanic populations that had uh, voted for him. And uh, so he left the bad loans on the book, uh, evicted uh, the families. Uh, their properties were bought up largely by absentee landlord, private capital firms, and by BlackRock and uh, companies like that. Well, let's the, back, let's yeah. back up a little bit on that, Michael, because uh, you know, as chairman of the Domestic Policy Subcommittee, uh, during uh, the um, in the wake of the subprime meltdown, what we found out is that uh, banks were going into neighborhoods in the in the African American community, and uh, with no doc, low doc loans that enabled people to get to get a better home. In some cases, the home of their dreams, uh, without uh, giving people a fair chance to see if they could actually afford it. And then, of course. Uh, they booked those loans and then they bundled them into uh, collateralized uh, debt obligations. And then uh, furthermore, Wall Street turned that into derivatives, pyramided the market, the thing collapses. There's a call on the loans, people can't pay, defaults are going on all over the country. Cleveland was the epicenter of the subprime meltdown, especially in, in the black community. And all of a sudden, the wealth that people had embedded in the homes, they lost them. Uh, whole neighborhoods were were laid waste. Uh, they were stripped of their uh, value in terms of you know uh, pipes and copper and anything that that uh, ghouls could carry away. Uh, then then came uh, scavengers who went into the neighborhoods, bought the pro bought the homes at a uh, the shells at a rock bottom, uh, made some minor repairs to and flipped them to create another uh, opportunity and still more victims. So what's happened is the the, the uh, financial community and the financialization of our economy, focusing on 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 where the wealth that Amer most Americans have in their homes, has been able to suck that money out and and financialize it, turning the whole country and Wall Street into one great casino. And as a result, going back to the point you're making, the wealth of the of the of the country is just accelerating upwards and um and the government has basically let this happen the government when it picks winners and losers it sided with wall street against the people of the country but dennis yeah. they were right, able to absolutely. collect their fees and their shareholders did well yeah. and so did the executives you're being a little petty i think <laughs> yeah right well just because yeah. the american people you represent got screwed who cares well, you, you know, that was one of the issues in, in the hearings that we had uh, investigating the subprime meltdown. You know, the, the issues of of uh, of compensation, of whether uh, uh, public invent of the public was misled, investors were misled. Uh, you know, there was and no one wanted to take responsibility. Ultimately, I mean, they said they did, but they didn't really want to take legal responsibility. You know, whether whether it was AIG, uh, Bank of America. Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers, that whole sordid situation went on. The government looked the other way. The Fed looked the other way. They were supposed to be monitoring lending practices. And the American people, uh, homeowners, just took it right in the neck. And in terms of the black community, the wealth of African Americans around the country crashed, just crashed during this period. 
Well, that's exactly what happened. And uh, as you just pointed out, not only uh, uh, the black Americans, but for uh, 13 years, the entire economy has been polarizing. And the the wealth, all the, the growth in uh, wealth, there's been a huge inflation, the largest inflation in American history. And it hasn't been price inflation. It hasn't been consumer price inflation. It's asset price inflation for stocks and bonds and real estate. And uh, the government uh, says, well, look at how Rich, much richer Americans are getting. They can afford their homes are worth more and more and more. But all of this home uh, pricing has been uh, financed by debt, and so the, ho the homeowners who are taking out mortgages to buy the homes own a smaller and smaller and smaller proportion uh, of their home uh, in equity. It's almost all, all debt. Well. The question is, why did the Fed end all of this? Here, here you have the economy's polarizing, great for the political campaign contributors. Why did it end it? Well, it ended it because uh, uh, Federal Reserve Chairman Powell said uh, there, there's a problem. Two million Americans have to lose their job in order to create enough unemployment so that wage levels are not going to go up and uh, they will not uh, uh, rise in keeping with the inflation of uh, oil prices and home prices uh, and food prices uh, that result from America's uh, sanctions against Russia that have raised prices all over the world uh, and uh, from the uh, monopoly pricing. So the, the Fed said we have to raise uh, the interest rates in order to bring on a recession, uh, lower wage levels, and it didn't... <laughs> Seem to have occurred to him that in a, a not, you're not only going to lower wage rates, but uh, when interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And Would you uh, explain, Michael, prices go one down. second. Would you explain the two major points you just made? And one was about monopoly prices. And the fact is that there was corporate gouging of profits from monopolies was one of the key. And also the supply chain problems that occurred because of the Ukraine war, okay? And explain how those are actually a larger factor and they're doing it on the back of American workers. They're going to quote, stem this problem on the back of American workers by driving up inflation. I thought Elizabeth Warren was very good in hearings actually last week on that. Well, she was attacking the uh, monopolists. Let's look at food prices, uh, where you can all follow when you go to the store. Uh, the 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 food prices for eggs and uh, uh, other food, uh, crops uh, are uh, going way up, but the farmers aren't getting more. The dairy farmers are going out of business. The chicken farmers are going out of business. There are a couple of monopolies for the food distribution uh, business. Uh, and uh, these monopolies have simply uh, taken uh, a much uh, larger uh, chunk of uh, uh, the prices that they supply to the stores. Uh, and right across the board, the pharmaceutical companies uh, have a monopoly. And they say, we're going to raise the prices for our drugs because we anticipate there's going to be an inflation. And right down the line for almost every proper, every kind of product that uh, is a monopoly, the monopolist said, well, uh, the Fed says there's going to be an inflation. We're going to raise our prices now. And the prices have been risen without any of their costs rising uh, just because they can do it. Uh, well, look, and, uh, well, look at look at the compounding issues here. So President President Biden makes the decision to pour over one hundred and forty billion dollars plus into this uh, enterprise trying to trying to overthrow Russia. That, of course, and, and the blowing up of Nord Stream pipeline set the stage for a sharp increase in energy prices, which also set the stage for a sharp increase in food prices apart, okay? And then you go to the monopoly factors that are working in the economy, and that's why people are end up paying so much for eggs and bread and everything else, because there's a compounded thing. You raise another point. You know, it's a long-standing canard of the Fed that a certain amount of unemployment is necessary for the proper functioning of the economy. Well, that's easy for the people in Wall Street to say, but tell that to Main Street where people are struggling, you know, to, to uh, put gas in a car, to pay their mortgage, to, uh, to feed their families. And so the, there's a, a kind of a destructive undermining of, of, the, of Main Street once more uh, in the way that a, a street hollows out before it collapses, but the hollowing out of 
of, uh, of the equity, as you mentioned, that people have in their homes, the hollowing out of savings, the hollowing out of pensions, all of this sets the stage for, for a financial collapse. And the money that was pumped in uh, during the um, COVID period uh, actually belied the fact that people were just, you know, then were desperate. And now, as that period seems to be over, they're going to be more desperate. As a matter of fact, as we're speaking, the government's getting ready to cut in half the food benefits that people had with the supplementary uh, nutrition uh, benefits. So people won't be able to have the food they needed. Meanwhile, back on Wall Street, uh, you know, you, uh, you screw up the management of a bank. Uh, you, you don't have uh, proper accounting standards. Uh, you have inadequate due diligence. You have a lack of regs. There's changes in the law. Uh, the Fed's going on uh, policies of working against the country. And Main Street gets hit once again. I, I really think that we have the preconditions here for a political revolt in this country. Uh, I want to introduce something, China. Dennis. You wrote a 696-page book called The Division of Light and Power, you know, which occurred when you basically saved the Cleveland Municipal Light System from its corporate competitor, which basically used what is now seen as illegal means to buy it out and destroy any competition. By the way, this competitor recently has uh, put $60 million into bribing Ohio officials. That's a whole other matter. You stood up against them uh, because you did not take any PAC money from these groups. Can you explain to me, and I'd like both of you to comment on this, is this contagion and this reluctance of Congress to deal with this issues of the banks and the, in, the incredibly dark, dark influence of dark money going to spread? Is the bank contagion going to spread, Michael? And how much worse is going to have to get, Dennis, before people recognize the utility bills, all the debt they are incurring will cause a debt deflation as the class evaporates and doesn't buy products. Well, I want to comment on what Dennis just was saying, because uh, I want to follow up uh, the logic. He pointed out uh, that the uh, savings were being eroded by uh, workers, not only their own savings, but that of their pension funds. Because when you wind down interest rates, uh, pension funds uh, uh, had corporations set aside uh, a given amount of money, or uh, states and municipalities to set aside a, a given amount to pay uh, the workers. And they uh, almost all assumed that they were going to be able to make eight and a half percent a year. Uh, but now that interest rates went down to about 0.2 percent uh, on government bonds, all of the pensions in this country were uh, pushed into deficit. So uh, who is going to rescue them? Well, you've just seen uh, the Fed rescue uninsured bank depositors, saying no uh, wealthy bank depositor will, even though they're not insured, no one will lose a penny. Uh, but the pension funds are going to lose as much as they, uh, as much as uh, uh, they, they have. The savers are going to lose. And by the way, the student debtors are going to have to pay their debts. The only debts that do not have to be paid are the debts owed by the wealthiest 1% to 10%. The rest of the 99% have to pay their debts. I think that's what Dennis was uh, pointing to. You're, you're, and thank you for mentioning that because, you know, what you have here is a clear example of the, um, of the socialization of risk that, that goes on. And, uh, you know, this is where capitalism, uh, the underlying um, um, challenge to the, to the system of capitalism is that there's a number of myths that support it. And, and one of the myths is that uh, uh, we all benefit from competition, uh, that people are on their own to go up and down by their own merits. Well, we have a massive moral hazard here that's been visited upon the country, and and it needs to be uh, addressed directly, uh, lest the country itself fail. And you know there there are deeper issues here uh, that uh, have to do with monetary policy itself. Uh, you know we most people are not aware uh, that in 1913 the money supply of America was privatized with the passage of the Federal Reserve Act. It's not a coincidence that the government created. Uh, almost simultaneously, 
the federal income tax so that uh, instead of government issuing the money to meet the needs of the country, uh, government started borrowing money from banks. So the government goes into debt. It's a, our whole system has been turned upside down uh, by, uh, and, and, and the corollary today is regulatory capture. You have all these agencies that cannot enforce uh, the law because they're held uh, captive by these financial interests, either through the executive branch or the legislative branch. And David, to answer your question directly, uh, Citizens United case, Buckley versus Vallejo, the idea of uh, speech now. Speech. We're we're right now in an era where we're seeing that the door was open for the corporatization of the of the entire government, um, and uh, because these these corporations essentially have a hammer lock on uh, on government policy because they can pour unlimited amounts of money uh, through through these uh, dark money packs into campaigns and totally upend uh, the political fortunes of those who are either executing the laws or making them. Well, Dennis, you just said uh, uh, two uh, key words. One is the lack of competition and the other is banking. And I should have said that the banking is uh, the most powerful monopoly uh, in the country. Uh, let's look at what the banks have been paying depositors. Uh, even though interest rates have been going way up, banks have only been paying depositors 0.2% on their deposits. Well, the reason that the banks uh, that uh, Silicon Valley Bank went under and the reason other banks are going under is that uh, they're, the banks are greedy. They, uh, they're making a killing on higher interest rates. Uh, they're raising the prices that they charge people uh, for mortgage loans, for bank loans, for credit card loans, but they're not uh, giving the depositors anything more. So the uh, if you're a depositor who have enough money to uh, you ha have a retirement fund or your own money, you're going to pull your money out of the bank. And instead of holding money in a bank at 0.2%, you're going to buy a, a short-term treasury bond at uh, a uh, treasury note at uh four percent interest and that's exactly what was happening last uh, thursday and friday that's what caused the run keep uh, uh, not only for silicon valley bank but for the entire country uh americans have been pulling their money out of the banks because the banks don't pay interest uh you want to get something that does pay interest and you don't want to uh, speculate in the stock market because that's going down so uh, you bought you buy bonds and that's why yesterday uh or on, actually on monday uh moody's came out and downgraded the entire banking system as being uh, no longer uh, uh, really uh, uh, viable uh, because the banks have gotten so they've used their monopoly power to shoot themselves in the own foot and be so greedy that uh, that they really don't play a productive function and so uh, you, of course yeah, yeah. you want to talk about how how things have changed i mean there was a time when the banks were actually uh, dictating rating standards uh, to, to the Wall Street ratings agencies on behalf of certain clients. Uh, the, the, the other thing is, in the wake of, of the collapse of these three banks, uh, I think it's time to have a whole uh, series of questions about uh, what, what were those banks' capital standards? What were their liquidity standards? What were their leverage standards? Because it's, it becomes very clear when you see uh, what appears to be a, a quick collapse was the result of, of practices that these banks were able to get away with uh, because no one was looking over their shoulder and they were basically uh, the uh, banking equivalent of honor park. Uh, and I'm sorry that didn't work, but what's happening now, very interesting, is that uh, look, I'm not a fan of uh, so-called wokeism, whatever you know people call that, but they're trying to blame the collapse of the banks on certain cultural and 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 social and racial minorities, which is uh, you know could cause heaven to grow hair. You, it is it is absolutely a um, a, a catastrophe that was engineered inside the banks not because they suddenly uh, wanted to show themselves in a more progressive light, but because they could have been using that as a cover to just uh, 
engage in any kind of uh, sharp practice. Dennis, Dennis I must say that you worry me, though, because it sounds like you may even like be pushing for things like better braking systems and trains and things like that. So I think you're a little out of control right now. Yeah, right. Uh, Dave, how about better, how about better braking systems in banking, right? Yeah, I, I, I want to focus on, yeah, on what he said about uh, uh, rating systems uh, and management. You can uh, ask these questions, but who's going to answer them? Well, the, uh, the answer is who was uh, in charge of overseeing the banks? Who were the bank examiners? Well, the bank examiners uh, and the bank regulators were all, as Dennis just said, appointed by the banks. Uh, if the if you were blacklisted by the banks, you'd be treated <laughs> like the banks wanted to treat Dennis. Uh, uh, you were considered overqualified for the position. Uh, the banks uh, wanted examiners who would treat them as their clients, who's, who thought that, well, we're here as the Federal Reserve examiner or the Federal Home Loan Bank examiner uh, to really uh, help the banks uh, get by. We're their protectors. We're their guardians. And uh, there, uh, one of the problems is that there are many bank regulatory agencies and banks, not, banks get to choose the regulatory agency that uh, uh, governed them. And uh, the Silicon Valley Bank chose the Federal Home Loan Bank Board, which is what, uh, if, if you're going to stretch the envelope, if you're going to do something that is wildly risky, you want the Federal Home Loan Bank Board to be your examiner because they they were the people who didn't see the uh, savings and loan crisis of the 1980s. Uh, they were the most uh, corrupt, uh, pro-banker, uh, the, the customer is always right, uh, examiners there were. And uh, the funny thing is that Silicon Valley Bank didn't doesn't make home loans. It made big loans to the uh, high tech industries uh, and also to uh, the governor of California, Newsom, and his uh, winery. Uh, he kept his uh, uh, money money there. But uh, th they don't make uh, uh, home loans. But uh, any bank can choose the home loan bank examiner board be precisely because uh, they uh, uh, they qualify for believing that uh, whatever the banks decide uh, to do must. Uh, be reasonable. Michael, I want to just cut in a little bit and point out, Dennis, in the lead up to the Iraq war, you spoke on the floor of Congress 341 times about Iraq, and you saw no evidence. You spoke 155 times on Iran, and at one great uh, advertising person put it, you had the eyes that saw through the lies, okay? What are the lies you're seeing today around banking and Nord Stream and these other things. I may just veer off a little bit, but you've been confronting some of these egregious misstatements. Well, it, begin, it begins with, um, uh, let me talk about this conceptually. Uh, we have a breakdown in trust in society, which is affecting everything. Uh, people, putting their money in banks is a matter of trust. What banks do with that money will either confirm or undermine the trust that people have in the banks. Government has to play a role in making sure that people's assets are going to be protected from any sharp practices. I mean, those are, those are what we hope will happen, but what we have found out in the past and what we're finding out again is that government does not perform its role as a uh, as a protector of the public interest. And when that happens on matters of the environment or the economy or uh, any other thing in the market, uh, the people of the United States are going to find that they're going to lose uh, investments. Uh, they're going to, in some cases, uh, lose their businesses. I mean, think of all the people out in Silicon Valley and in the reach within the reach of the banks that have now gone down, who really, have, you know, have set up businesses that had a lot of drive and a lot of hope and a lot of passion, and they needed to make sure there was a cop on the beat to protect their aspirations to protect the jobs that they created. And, and yes, the government stepped in and said, okay, nobody's going to get hurt. But the fact of the matter is that all of us get hurt. 
because if you had another nine trillion dollars to the 31 trillion, and even before this happened, there was already predictions that America is going to go to over 50 trillion dollars in debt within 10 years. When you look at that, it means there's a lack of fiscal discipline, which harms the country. It harms our ability to uh, uh, in international trade. It 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 puts us on a on a on a on a um, in a direction of not of deflation one day and the next day hyperinflation. So we're we're really uh, in a, at risk here as Americans. Our economy is at risk, and I'm sure the president understands that, which is why he he put a stop uh, on on the closing closing uh, or the destruction of these banks. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we're not dealing dealing with the underlying uh, causes here. This is a you, you, this, this you is a an issue of trust. And I wanted to ask Mike. Go ahead. This, yeah. this is a tourniquet well, on, a, yeah. on a on a wound. It's not fixing yeah. the wound. Well, you understand this, Dennis. I'm not because we've spoken about uh, deindustrialization for uh, 20 years. Uh, uh, what you've described is exactly that America's deindustrializing. If Americans have to pay such high prices for their homes, if they have to go so deeply into debt just to have a place to live or to rent, if they have to borrow from the banks and run into credit card debt in order to uh, just meet uh, meet their basic needs, how they're going to have to earn so much money that it prices uh, American industry out of world markets. That's why uh, uh, American uh, uh, companies have all moved abroad. They can't afford to pay American labor when American labor's living costs have to be paid to the financial sector and the real estate sector, which is part of the financial sector that uh, uh, you, you've just been describing. That's the real problem. The banks are uh, responsible for deindustrializing the country, making it so uh, by squeezing uh, uh, labor's living standards while raising the price of uh, uh, of uh, everything that uh, uh, labor needs to buy. Michael, what do you say to people who say banks lend out money to businesses all the time? That's their main function. But you point uh, out in your books that 80% of the money is for what? The, 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 for mortgages. Uh, banks banks don't lend money for startups. Uh, no. a private uh, stock uh, initial uh, public offerings in the stock market uh, ra uh, raises money for new capital investment. Banks only lend against collateral that's already in place. Not not to uh, create new means of production, but you can pledge it. Uh, the or, but they do make uh, loans to corporations to buy other corporations. They make loans to corporate raiders. They make loans for uh, leveraged buyouts because you can make more money by borrowing money to buy a corporation, uh, taking it over, running it into debt, breaking it up into parts, uh, uh, firing uh, or uh, the labor. Uh, and moving it abroad than you can do by employing American labor. So you, the problem, the, it's economy, this is a serious structural problem. We're not dealing with just one bank going bad, uh, bad because it uh, was not competently managed. We're talking about what Dennis was talking about, the polarization that is uh, 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 crushing American prosperity. Michael, I want to refer back to something you said a moment ago when you talked about deindustrialization. Because this, this, um, and I put a fine point on it. America used to make cars. We're the leader in the world in in, in manufacturing cars. We, we were the leader in the world in steel. We were the leader in the world unchallenged in in aerospace. We were the leader in the world on shipping. Now that that was part of our strategic industrial base. And it was a strategic economic base. It helped protect our country, but it also helped uh, give people very good uh, middle class jobs. As, as we engaged in these um, trade agreements, uh, the General Agreement on Tariffs and, and Trade, NAFTA, um, uh, and uh, China Trade, uh, and, and other trades with certain regions, uh, what we did is we moved the good paying jobs out. What did we, we replace it with in the economy? We financialize the economy. So we don't make things anymore. We create financial products. And, and this is where um, our nation 
uh, which used to be the leader in manufacturing. Uh, this is where our nation has uh, taken a turn that um, uh, if we do not correct the course, can only lead again and again and again to one financial crisis after another. There's a point at which uh, people on one hand lose confidence in, in the system, and the other one is the system just doesn't have the capacity to, to uh, recover without the in inevitable effects of hyperinflation. Will, any, will either party have the courage to do what is necessary, which is certainly increasing taxes for the uber rich who have just grown far out of proportion, the grown exponential wealth as Michael was describing, which you know compounds the wealth over a period of time, and the necessity that people who are working get a share of the profits that they're able to organize, that they're able to share in the immense wealth that we create in this country for the top. Will either party address those issues about income or wealth taxes or reigning in the power of this dark money? Well, I, I, I could uh, give a brief answer to that, which is um, uh, it's unlikely. Uh, we're not looking at a Rooseveltian period here where um, uh, the, uh, those who were uh, I find it. I find it stunning. Quick tangent that uh, you know. I find both parties with huge lackings in different ways. I was stunned when my party. I'm a Democrat. When my party attacked, you know, somebody who writes books like Griftopia about the Wall Street collapse, and Matt Taibbi, calling him a so-called journalist, which I was joking about before, who had the courage to actually write. Or they also go after Glenn Greenwald, who wrote one of the great books, you know, with liberty and justice for some. Just a couple, but a you know a, a, a you know you, you saw how they went after Brand, you know the comedian. Uh, it, it's just sort of stunning to me that where is their patriotism rather than their party? When does patriotism and concern for the people that elected them come in, Dennis? Well, when the when the when the people are hurting enough, when they're ready to uh, to basically say, look, um, this is a uni party moment and the party isn't you know the parties aren't working for us well i think on that sort of depressing note i guess we might want to end this up i don't want to leave people on a downer at this point in time but i really was happy that the two of you could talk and and talk about the systemic problems that are cropping up in this country and why these banks failed and why Wealth is being distributed, redistributed up the economic pyramid, and no one says anything about it. I call the GOP sometimes the greed-only party because they will never vote for tax increases. But they seem to be better on matters of war and peace right now. The Democratic Party seems to be all war all the time. I'm sorry. Okay, they'll fight to the last Ukrainian dies, which is sickening me. I have four children, and I think about how, how the, the grief that never goes away as your society and your families are torn asunder. So any last thoughts from either of you? Michael? Uh, well, it's very striking that the Republicans are seeing uh, uh, that the war is uh, wrecking the whole economy. Uh, uh, Dennis talked about how the steel industry can uh, uh, get going again. Well, it got going by blowing up the uh, gas pipeline and without gas and Russian oil, uh, you can't make steel in Germany anymore. So uh, the uh, the war of, really is not only has turned out not to be only against uh, fighting to the last Ukrainians, it's uh, uh, making uh, Europe uh, broke, pushing Europe into a chronic long-term depression and uh, and really break ending uh, German uh, industry and uh, uh, America says well why don't you move your steel making companies to the United States where we have uh, cheap gas and oil and uh, now that you have to pay six times uh, as much for energy and energy is really what you make GDP out of so America's strategy in the world is saying well we realize that we're losing uh, the com competition to China and Asia and India. Uh, and uh, the whole rest of the world, but at least we can lock in our control of Europe. 
uh, and we can make money off uh, Europe, Canada, and Australia, uh, uh, and at least we can keep uh, going there by essentially acting as uh, a rentier. And uh, uh, it's uh, uh, th the result is uh, something that at a certain point it's driving other countries uh, away. And uh, I don't think there's any truth at all that uh, Biden is a, uh, in, uh, working for the Chinese government as a paid agent. I think that's just a, a vicious <laughs> rumor. But what he's done is uh, force uh, by the sanctions on Russia, he's forced Russia to give China energy at uh, much lower prices than anywhere else in the world. Uh, the effect of Biden's strategy is to enormously increase Chinese competition and uh, Iranian competition and Asian competition against the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, uh, it's ironic. And uh, the the sanctions against Russia have made Russia decide, OK, we're going to become autonomous and independent. You know, what I, what I would like to do is to uh, conclude this with the idea that perhaps we can uh, go deeper into this discussion in, uh, in a future conversation uh, with respect to, uh, number one, how America's uh, international policies, specifically with respect to war, and the building up of, of, of a massive armament undermines us here at home. That's number one. Number two is uh, how America's insistence on the unipolar moment, as, as you alluded, Michael, uh, driven other nations together in, in economic alliances that I believe inevitably will uh, will lead to the decline of the dollar yes. and will create circumstances where the American economy is going to lose the elasticity it's had over the last 50 years as a result of the dollar's uh, uh, primacy. So maybe we could get into that in, uh, in the future. I want to thank uh, uh, Dave Kelly for uh, convening this and moderating this discussion. And Michael, it's good to see you again. Uh, let's get together again. Thank you very much for the input, gentlemen. I hope Thank so. you. Thank you. Forward to it.